Yeah, this is somebody I wanted to talk about before we get to the questions. Dave Legino, uh, what, what a guy he was. Tell us about yeah. Dave Legino who passed away in, in kind of weird circumstances, wasn't it? Very strange circumstances. But how he, how he came into my life, how he actually came into my life, is I was going to a nightclub called... I can't remember Paradise, something like that. Colton was it? Colton was uh, was running the door over there, and I had a little posse of people with me, and was going into going into this nightclub. And David Sheen, I was on the door, I never met him before. And just as we was going to walk into the door, a car drove past, a black BMW, slowed down sufficiently enough to make everyone look at it. It was revving up before it got there. Two guns popped out the front and back window and let off about five or six shots at the door. Everyone hit the deck, including moi, right? And I'm now left hanging onto a leg of this Dave Vichino who was standing there, just like it, like they would have bounced off him. That is what it looked like to me. That is what it looked like to me from lying on the floor where I was, pushing people in front of me, you know, like, yeah. uh, lying on the floor, looking up to him, and he was just standing there like that. Because they were bang, 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 bang. No one got hit. Uh, and then uh, shut off. I thought, wow, man, that is godlike. Yeah, I want that. I want him as mine. And I ended up befriending that man, made him one of my closest friends, and moved him into my house, a flat I had on my own. And he became my flatmate for about two years. In that two years, he got into the American wrestling, the prize fighting. My wife used to make all these uniforms, used to come in the ringers. Uh, red Indian with a chamois leathers and real snake. I had a 20 foot boa constrictor living in my flat for Jesus Christ. Smelt like a zoo. Right? He then went on to start making films. He was in all the Harry Potter films. Incredibly good looking, intelligent, six foot four, uh, body beautiful, six hours a day in the gym, you know, an actual proper tool, excuse me. And um, I married him. I actually married him. I, we had a yacht and we went out into neutral waters three miles out. And as the captain of a ship, which the captain went, I'm now going to the toilet, Dave, you are now in charge of the helm. He went downstairs and as a, as a, as a captain, I married him and his wife with, with the book and all that out at sea in neutral waters. I've got all the photographs. I was with um, Danny, Mickey, myself, him, his wife. And I dressed up as Nelson. I've got pictures of it in, in, in one of the books, I think. I got then, confused there, yeah. Dave. I got confused there when, when you said that you married him. I thought there was something. <laughs> something. <laughs> I mean, it was a lady at the time, right? Yeah. He stayed with that lady. Funny enough, she came from Arizona and um, it only lasted about six or seven weeks and she shut off. He then, at the end of his life, he booked an holiday to America and walked into the uh, um, Arizona desert and just walked in as deep as he could with no water or nothing like that, as far in as he could. So he couldn't get back and just sat under a cactus and roasted and died to die, you know, just baked to death. What a tragedy. Uh, well, a, a huge tragedy, a huge tragedy. For whatever reason it was, one of the numbers that one of the numbers that um, was in his book or whatever it was was mine, and they rung me from there. So I was one of the first people to know. Yeah, you know, I remember it. meeting uh, him on a, a film set. I was filming you on a film set. I mean, you were doing a film together. I can't remember if it was a short film or something. Do you remember that film? I can't remember what it was. I do. Yeah, it was with um, John. What's his name from? Yes, one from the grave. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, a, a lovely man, and he, he talked all the about dealer. you. The dealer, it that's was it, called. that's it, and 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 he talked all about you and uh, what a great bloke you were and stuff like that. And what what a sort of humble, nice man he was. Fantastic, humble is the word. He was yeah. also a dog, so you know he could at the, at the switch of a switch, at the click of a switch, turn into your biggest fucking nightmare. Mm -hmm. you no, know, he went into the he went into the bare knuckle fight game. And, and got as high as you could get in that. He went into the acting and got into all the Harry Potter films. He went into the music world and then made a few albums with it and went on tour. Now, everything he'd done, he was good at, focused. Yeah, yeah. Focused. fantastic. All right, moving on to some, uh, some subscriber questions here. Uh, Tim Smith, I don't know if you know this guy, 
Dave saved my older brother's <laughs> life at Q at QU, he says. I saved yeah. a lot of his lives at Queens. That was one <laughs> of the action packed nightclubs I ever worked. It's, it's in uh, Colnebrook, Langley, beside his brother Airport. Yeah. And then where the actual nightclub is situated, it's, it's the um, Queen Mother's Reservoir in the daytime. And in the nighttime, the yacht club that was there, was they turned into a nightclub. Right. And it's very close to an awful lot of big traveller sites, which happened to be a very tasty bunch of travellers as well. So my work was cut out on a nightly basis. Um yeah, I think we, the, we talked about Queen's last time. You said it was fantastic, wasn't it? What a, well, what a club. It built Dave Courtney. It helped build Dave Courtney. Right? It was me, um, my knuckle duster, 10 other doormen, and a lady called Karen. Um, they were all the people that defended that nightclub for about four or five years. Did you did you have um, a lady doormen, a door lady? So what would you call it? <laughs> Yeah, but I had a partner at the time called Karen that was that was um, a necessity for, for, for the doors that I was working there. She would carry the bits and pieces that I did want to and, and look the absolute for me, you know. <laughs> it was no such thing as a lady doorman then, no. No, no. Okay. The door, they had sheepskin coats, the arms ripped off, they were big sideburns and looked like a bundle of egg. You know, four doormen running the hippodrome and there was 2,000 people in it, two outside on the door. One inside upstairs with his thousand, and one inside downstairs with his thousand. I told you before. Yeah, you know, yeah. They bastards. They were very no, no, Michael, no walkie talkies to go. Trouble action. Number five needs some assistance, uh, and none of that. You went help me and run in. Right? You know, do do you day. miss? Do you miss all of that, Dave? Yeah, I do. But I'm no longer capable to do that. But it actually took an awful lot of testosterone away from the actual man side of the human race, I'm afraid. Yeah. The health and safety and the laws have slowly chipped away at the at men. And we've got a watered down version of what a man is supposed to be, I'm afraid. Yeah, have I, I agree. At you people, if I said something politically not right, but there's a very watered down version of man today than when I was talking Absolutely. Uh, AJ says um, he thinks you're uh, really interesting. Um, he says, well, what's the bad side of a gangster life and, and uh, uh, the tragedy of it all? Um, the, is, tra is it the tragedy of it all is, please believe me, the gangster life is only glamorous on things like this, mm -hmm. in books and films, which is that much of your life. The rest of it ain't nice. Everyone around you suffers for your choice of way of life. Your children, your your wife, your friends, your fa your family, they suffer. You know, any enemies you decide to make don't like them now because they don't like you. Me going to prison, you know, not that it's, it's easy and nice in there, but it's your wife and children that do the bird, not you. You are getting fed every day. You have got a roof over your head, and but, but they're out there expecting to do whatever, with you ringing up every day, going, have you done that yet? <laughs> you know, like, um, the, 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 the pluses for being a gangster are nowhere near as as, as many as the crosses. Right? Mm -hmm. That's the truth. So The pluses are good. Hold it, hold it. The pluses are good. You've normally got a much cuter wardrobe, a very pretty missus, a very tasty car, and seem to be out an awful lot more than everyone else is. Right? Only for a little period of time. And then you pay dearly for that for the rest of your life. Right? While I was actually a, an active G, yeah, while I was there, it was, it was only a fraction of my life. I've now paid for it every day since, and I'm still paying for it. I still can't go on holiday to America. I can't go on holiday and see my children in Australia, I don't think. I can't get a license to open a pub. I can't open a, a minicab office with radios. I can't, they, you know, they're expected to kick my door down every time something goes wrong. And I'm now no longer in that world, but I'm paying for it every single solitary day. My children are paying for it when they go to school. Oh, your dad's this, your dad, you know, uh, my children are paying for it. Um, one, of my, one of my daughters is in the army mm -hmm. and can't actually get any item than, than she is because her dad is day. Right? Do you think I feel about that? Yeah. You know, so the... Long-term crosses 
a lot more than the immediate pluses that you get at the time. But if you'd have asked me at the time, would I have changed it? I would go, no. Right. Well, do you, I mean, everything. do you regret it now? I mean, would you... I if you... No, I'm an idiot, ain't I? No, I don't. Mm. No. I don't. And I should go, yes. But I don't, because I've had too many good things happen in my life, and I haven't ended up with a massive gravity lump of bird right around me. I haven't got mm. too many holes in me. Yes. And... There was um, a couple of questions here that people were asking about the time that you got run off the road and ended up in, in, in hospital. Was it? Do you believe it really was the police that ran you off the road? I am 999% sure it was the police. I was actually taken into court at the time for uh, attempted murder because they actually called me a grass and it was proved in court that I won't. Mm-hmm. Yeah, they was actually making it look like I was and it was proved in court that it, it actually was a load of... The couple went to prison. I got not guilty. That's my only day, by the way. I got no guilt in the cup. I got uh, five years. Right? So then I, I was taken to the court to go and say, well, look, you know, what you said about me was going to get get me killed. And I'm saying that you were saying it, even though I gave them the tape on the day I was arrested, which proved it was nothing to do with me and I weren't a grass. Mm-hmm. I, I bugged the cup. I, I said, they knew right from the start that it weren't me and started publicising that it was, which did actually alter my life a, a lot. Right? Yes. It did change direction of things and hurt me so they won really and while i'm actually taking it in the court for this which is in a court case i can't lose because i've got the tape of going look it ain't nothing doing me but they still carried on with it um while driving up the m4 at 100 mile an hour at 12 o'clock at night with not a drink or a drug inside me otherwise they wouldn't have been able to operate on me i see a white volvo state come up behind me with his headlights on and I thought, shall I move out of the way? I looked down, I was doing about 95, and I was in a Range Rover, and I thought, I won't pull over, because they go a bit like that. I thought, let him go around me, and he went out of my sight and pinged me. Really? Now, I know an awful lot of naughty people, and a lot of people that have killed other people, and I don't know anyone, apart from policemen that do the pit manoeuvre on someone on the A2 while it's all camered up. And when I didn't die, mm-hmm. I... I, all of the all of the footage of all of the cameras on the motorway that day were not turned on. Stop it. Yeah, yeah. Stop it. They happened to say if anyone wants to go and check up or you know, look check up on what I'm saying now, that the car behind me just happened to be two un, um, non-working policemen that took 14 statements of what happened. And then because I was in a coma for seven weeks, when I came round, I got in touch with the police station for these statements. They went, they've been lost. If Mr. Courtney doesn't understand an office environment, I'm afraid things get lost. And they have gone. Right? They now can't be brought and question what they see because there's an ongoing investigation about me which they're involved in, so they can't be questioned about me. And they've lost all of the videotapes of the accident. So, you know, how many coincidences, how many coincidences do you need before it can't be a coincidence no more? They run me over, or I was going to take them a call. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, was- I've got a question here about all of that. He said, uh, as as Medeus, he says, I've noticed Dave has not talked about the guys that guarded him in hospital after the car crash. He says, so were, were there lots of people looking after you in the, in the hospital? But you there know, two. Doors? two. One of them, I'm afraid, uh, hung himself um, over something, and the other one, the mate. The other fellow was a man called Soul, a massive giant of a man that looked after me while I was in hospital in case whoever it was wanted to come back and do something. And by the time I was still there for a week, he hadn't gone home for a week, he hadn't changed. No, no. And so his, his wife is now sitting there going, I'll come and come home. He said, well, I can't come home now in case it happens now. And, I mean, and, and now, now I'm in a coma for three weeks. He still hasn't come home. And a pair of them are looking after me, standing at the door of my private um Walled, yeah, and they stayed there for seven weeks until us till us come round, then went home. And I hate to say this, I, I do believe that I was the cause of Soul's um, marriage break. I do believe. I don't know. Someone correct me if I'm wrong. I, 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 I please God, I'm wrong. But I, at the time, I thought I think I'm right. But yes. they looked for me. I loved them with all of my heart, with all of my heart. Mm-hmm. Yeah, they can walk in my house and live with me any day they want. Yeah. Like any I go and drop tools and come and move in with Dave, I'd say, yeah, I owe them. And then when I came out of the operation, uh, of the coma, 
because you'd been on that morphine for uh, you know, unless you've been on it, <laughs> you really, if you've been on that, you really cannot explain to someone what that does to you. You know, if that's what you feel like when you're an area that is um, goofing uh, inside, I can half understand it because I was in there talking to Elvis Presley, I was <laughs> all sorts of things, and and we're in a dream. If something touches you, you wake up, or a bang wakes you up. Some your mum knocking on your bedroom door fits in with the dream, didn't it? The banging, and you wake up. Well, in this thing here, yeah, you could they could touch you, and it's it's all still real. And you open your eyes, and it's all the dream is still real. It's it's a mad thing that um, morphine. So that for a, for a week odd, they had to put up with me talking absolute. Shit. Was there a moment did you, that they were thinking of turning you off, as it were? were yeah, there was. Think- yeah, no, this, the very first night when, when when all my ribs were broke, the punch in my lungs, I'd ripped my spleen off, I'd broke, I fractured my skull, and it was all sort of bro- uh, broken vertebrae off in my back. That, uh, you know, all sorts of things. I, I, I'm, while I'm in this coma, something you've got to know about comas for about thirty seconds. Your hearing comes back. You're still there, but your hearing comes back. And you can't let anyone know that you you, you can still hear. And my mum's crying on me and there's all people around and I can hear this vicar going, <laughs> well, stop. He's in no pain. He's in no pain. He's going to the other place. You know, They're giving me the last rites and I can hear it. And I'm running around inside my head trying to open one of my eyes or move a finger or something, you know, that's something just a little bit more right in here and then it all goes dark and you're gone. Right? But I heard him and then I think it's about three or four months later I was sitting there Sunday morning and I'm sitting up in bed I'm on the traction now, I'm okay. And I had some visitors and, and normally what happens is if you can't get out of bed you'll get a Protestant vicar come in, a Catholic, an imam, a monk, a Buddha all come in to see if you want and, and I wasn't looking at him and he goes Oh, I can see you're busy. He said, I'll come back in a minute. And I, the same voice that had gone, you're in no plane, you're in no plane. I was like, oh, no, no. <laughs> now, Dave, we've only got a minute left. It's because it's like that it gives us a timer on this. So it's been fantastic speaking to you, and we're going to be doing this uh, every week, and uh, people do send your questions in. I really wish you all the best. I'll see you later, Liam. Yeah, cheers. Thank you very much, Dave. Well done. Love you lots.